As long ago as AD 61, London was first a port and then a city. The port grew through the centuries, and indeed in the 16th century, as a result of the voyages of discovery in the Elizabethan era and the growth of English naval power, there was a shipping boom. Shipbuilding, timber, cooperage, rope making, armaments and victualling all flourished in the riverside areas. A system of 20 legal keys and 21 sufferance wharves was established to handle all dutiable goods entering the country. The volume of river traffic was too much for the legal and sufferance wharves to handle and vessels lay at anchor waiting for their turn to be unloaded. A prime target for the thieves who preyed on them. By 1799, thefts from ships had reached incredible proportions and the first of the docks was built to relieve the congestion and provide secure warehousing for the goods being shipped. St. Catherine's docks were the nearest to the city, half a mile below London Bridge and accessible to all ships. Not only were vessels unloaded there, but goods were also brought from the lower docks for warehousing. Surrey docks was the site of the first major dock to be constructed and the only docks on the south side of the river. Trade was mainly with the Baltic countries, Canada and America. The goods handled were mainly timber, bacon, cheese and fruit. The Greenland dock was the centre for whaling trade vessels. The Surrey docks were used by Atlantic and other liners and cargo vessels of up to 10,000 tonnes. Three miles away were West India and Millwall docks with entrances 80 feet wide. As the name implies, these docks originally had the monopoly of handling trade from the West Indies, mainly in fruit and vegetables. The East India docks at Blackwall owed their existence to the East India Trading Company and handled all the goods which the company dealt in, particularly tea. The huge Royal Victoria, Royal Albert and King George V docks could accommodate 60 vessels simultaneously. Trade included foodstuffs and merchandise from Australia, New Zealand and Africa. A big proportion of the goods handled were from the then enormous British Empire. The Royal docks were also used by the large ocean-going liners. The biggest to dock there at the time this film was made, 36,000 ton Mauritania. 30,000 skilled men were employed to deal with the specialist operations in the docks and warehouses, and thousands more were employed on the river and in the port. There were 10 dry docks where vessels could be repaired and maintained. Mechanically controlled girders effected the automatic centering of the vehicles in the dry dock. When sail gave way to steam, it was necessary for vessels to be refueled in the docks. Coaling operations such as this were carried out. Later, oil burning ships were introduced and these were refueled by special tanker barges equipped with pumping machinery. Cold storage warehousing facilities were available for meat and insulated rail vans carried meat and other perishable goods to every corner of Britain. London's docks were the heart of Britain's trade and the road and rail systems which operated from the docks were the arteries working together to carry the vital commerce throughout the country. Thousands of lorries and vans of every size, weight and power came constantly in and out of the docks carrying goods which had been brought into the country.
care and supervision of goods was not confined to the docks and warehousing. The customs authorities kept strict control of all dutiable goods. Electric and hydraulic cranes, the most up-to-date at the time, were used to lift the millions of tons of cargo which passed through the docks each year from every corner of the world, and which represented the livelihood of countless millions of people. Two and a half million tons of timber per year, one third of British timber imports, were imported from Finland, Russia, America, and the Arctic through Surrey docks. The wood was loaded onto barges in smaller quantities and sent to other ports in Britain. At Surrey docks alone, there was storage accommodation for half a million tons of timber in 140 acres of covered and open storage space. Nearly one million bales of wool a year, one quarter of the world's trade was brought through London's docks. Electric wool balers were used to speed up the process of stacking in the warehouses, which could cope with one million bales at a time. Sales were held six times a year on the wool exchange and the buyers inspected the goods thoroughly in order to fix the prices. Three quarters of a million tons of frozen meat came into the royals from South America, Australia and New Zealand. Specially insulated railway vans took the meat right from the dockside for distribution around the country. One quarter of Britain's grain and flour imports poured into the grain ships. The grain was unloaded by vacuum suction plants and the operation took from three to four days. 24,000 tons of grain could be stored at Millwall Granary. 45,000 tons of tobacco per year were handled at the Royal Docks, mainly from America and Rhodesia. Experts checked each barrel as it came in. The color, size, texture and condition of the leaf were examined carefully to ensure constancy of the quality. By the end of the Second World War, Docklands had suffered more bomb damage than any other civilian target in the British Isles. Nearly a thousand high explosive bombs and thousands of incendiaries fell on the port, destroying one third of the warehousing and half its storage accommodation. Thick smoke hangs over the heart of Britain as a choking dawn reveals the terrors of the night. London has been wounded during the hours of darkness, but what colossal strength runs in her veins? As hoses still play on the smouldering ruins, a fireman is heard to say, blimey, he wasn't half cross with us last night. Let every honor be given to the rescue parties, nurses and doctors, who toil for hours among the wreckage, bringing help and easing the suffering of survivors. From out the bowels of devastation, they bring the injured to be ministered by these gallant brothers and sisters of mercy. But in spite of it all, London carries on. Lummy, you ought to hear her carrying on. In no uncertain voice, she echoes Mr. Churchill's words, we'll give it to them back. Yes, this time we take the gloves off. Hitler has called the tune, and we'll give it a name. Retaliation. While demolition parties still work amid the ruins, the King and Queen travel from one district to another to express their sympathy and concern for those who have been made homeless. The King and Queen have brought the warmth of their friendship to those in distress. During the heyday of the docks, migrant labour had been attracted from all over Britain and the world. Casual labour was a feature of the dockers' lot, encouraged by the abundance and cheapness of the labour available, a system which was open to abuses and which bred discontent and militancy. 
In the early 1960s, the Dockers' militancy reached its height. First forklift trucks, then bulk handling by containerization, were seen by the Dockers as a menace to their livelihood. The bitter strikes which plagued the docks at that time were the final straw, and the decline of the docks gained momentum. By the 1970s, practically all the activity in the docks had died, leaving a legacy of dereliction. In 1979, when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer, Sir Geoffrey Howe conceived the idea for the regeneration of London's Docklands and the formation of an enterprise zone. By 1981, the London Docklands Development Corporation was given legal status, and in July 1982, the enterprise zone was open for business. The corporation had a pump priming role to play. Large areas were polluted by former industry on the sites, and the work started on cleaning up. The grant from the Department of the Environment was used to put in the basic infrastructure to enable development to start on the land. The red brick road was built to indicate the area of the enterprise zone and heralded the start improvements to road and motorway links at a cost of 200 million pounds. We realised that the first housing developments in the Isle of Dogs and Beckton would create a demand for improved shopping facilities and were delighted when Asda took the initiative and built their biggest supermarket on the Isle of Dogs. Communications were vital if industry was to be attracted into Docklands. 18 miles of fibre optic cables are operational in the area, and both British Telecom and Mercury are committed to providing the latest facilities in Docklands. The first of the transport initiatives was the Docklands Clipper, a good, fast, frequent bus service round the Isle of Dogs. Next came the DLR a fast, smooth, rapid transport system which operates along a seven and a half mile route from Tower Gateway to Island Gardens at the tip of the Isle of Dogs and linking with Stratford to join with the British Rail and London Underground routes. Her Majesty the Queen opened the DLR in July 1987. The London City Airport was opened in October of 1987, dramatically cutting journey times to European and UK destinations. The river was seen as the opportunity for a fast link to the airport from central London. Now there'll be some nine piers between uh, Westminster and Greenwich. About 17 minutes by, uh, by river bus, and I'm hoping that that's one coming around the corner there now. I think it is. And now they go on down to House of Commons. Yes, and we, they will eventually, or can eventually, get out to Putney. Well, they tell me they're going to go to Chelsea already by the yes, end. Yes, that's right. The greatest highway in, in this country, anyway. Up until now, pretty much misused or underused. Now with the river buses, Thames Line river buses coming down to 11 at the present time, about seat about the same as a double-decker bus, 150. But in fact, the Thames is London's greatest underused transport asset. Absolutely. So it'll be frightfully good for you, but it will also be good for commuters to the city, and people going to London City Airport. Absolutely. So it seems to me the spin-off there, I think, is one coming. The spin-off for you, from the, the, this use of the river in both directions, will be very great. Marvellous. And it's been already proven by um, Daily Telegraph, who've had their own private bus running up and down, taking journalists to um, Westminster and then back down to the Isle of Dogs. Well, I'm Great. determined you're going to have the best air, sea, water, road and rail access that anything anyone could conceivably have. Bravo. The central task for the London Docklands Development Corporation was to revive the Docklands economy with the objective of permanent regeneration of the area. 
was our job to attract industry and new businesses into the area with the ultimate goal of providing jobs and bringing back the people. We are now at the stage where development has gained its own momentum. Fleet Street, once recognized as the home of the major national newspapers, has moved downriver to Docklands. The Daily Telegraph was the first newspaper to move to the Isle of Dogs, and their example was followed by The Guardian, The Times, amidst a storm of protest, The Sunday Times, The Sun, The News of the World, Reuters, and latterly The Financial Times. Next year, we'll see the Mail, the Mail on Sunday, and the Evening Standard printed in Surrey Docks. Not only the large companies have come to Docklands, but many medium and small companies have come here too. Over 10,000 jobs have been created in the Docklands area since the corporation was formed, and over 12,000 houses have been built. Training initiatives have been started to prepare school leavers and young people for the job opportunities which will go hand in hand with the development. I suppose the highest point of our efforts over the lifetime of the corporation has been the completion of the Canary Wharf negotiations and with it the start of the largest development undertaken so far in Europe. No, not just a development, a new financial city in the making. You've never done a deal as quickly as that for something so significant. No, we've never faced deadlines like this before, <laughs> Reg. But uh, everybody worked very hard. A lot of cooperation, a lot of long nights. Mm -hmm. We're very pleased we are where we are. On Friday night, we carried out um, the longest series of exchanges of documents that I have ever witnessed in my life. Uh, it took about four and a half hours in actual fact to get the documentation actually signed and passed across the various tables. And that four and a half hours is the end of two and a half years of hard work um, in Docklands and with the Canary Wharf Consortium. And so let me now hand over and pass you over to uh, Mr. David Trippier, who is the Parliamentary Under Secretary at the Department of the Environment, who has special responsibility for the inner cities. Mr. David Trippier. Mr. Benson, uh, Mr. Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, this scheme marks the beginning of a, an exciting new era for London Docklands. It gives the City of London the room to expand, which London needs fully to exploit the growth in financial services, and it gives Docklands new investment and jobs on a scale which will consolidate its recent success. It is also a major success for the government's policy of promoting urban development corporations, which are now being extended to other parts of the country. And it will bring new life and wealth to derelict industrial land in those areas. Now, London Regional Transport have also reached agreement, as many of you will know, with the approval of the Secretary of State for Transport, with Olympia and York over the financing and construction of the £135 million pounds project to extend the Docklands Light Railway westward to uh, Bank Station. Under the terms of the railway agreement, Olympia and York will contribute some £67 million pounds to the cost of constructing that extension. It is a tribute to the concept of development corporations. I'm very happy to pay a particularly warm tribute to Chris Benson 
and his team, to thank also those of my officials in the Department of Environment who've been closely involved with this whole deal, and I'm grateful to you all for bringing it to such a successful conclusion. Thank you. Michael Honey will now tell you about the hopes for Docklands, which he and I share. I'm Michael Honey. I joined the Docklands as the new chief executive just a few weeks ago. This must be the most exciting project in Europe. Eight and a half square miles, as big as the city of Westminster and the city of London put together. seen, as I have, work starting on the Skanska development in Thomas More Street, one of the last important sites to be developed in the Wapping area, linking the Docklands with the old city of London. You've seen the model, and in a couple of years you'll see the reality up and occupied. We're now looking forward to the Royal Docks in our next challenge. The scale of these docks is breathtaking. They represent the largest stretch of urban development land in Europe. They provide space for development for 700 acres of homes, offices, space for high-tech industry, a major shopping centre and countless recreational opportunities. They will have a value between two and two and a half billion pounds, creating nearly 50,000 jobs and 7,500 homes. They'll start on site in the next year, and they'll be served by an extension to the Docklands Light Railway and a whole network of new roads. But our key resource in the Docklands is people, and it always has been. In all this surge of development activity, we mustn't forget the local people who were here before the development ever took place all the newcomers who've shown their commitment and belief in the Docklands by moving here. The time is now ripe to put greater emphasis on the social aspects of the Docklands. The key to the future of the Docklands in my book is partnership. Partnership with the local authorities on the development of social housing, recreation, leisure, education and community life. Partnership with developers to make Docklands a place that people will really enjoy living in and value as a place to live. Partnership with businesses to make sure that Docklands residents are able to compete successfully for the kind of jobs and the job opportunities that are coming online by taking major initiatives in terms of training and development of their staff. The greatest resource in the East End has always been local people, and historically, they've had a hard time in the Docklands. I'd like to see the corporation making a real effort to change things for the better, to improve the environment in which people live, and the quality and the standard of living here. I want to stress the key contribution that the business community can make to these areas, by getting involved and working alongside us, training people and helping them.
the stage. Yeah. Brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Mixed yeah. Very impressive. Yeah. Just what the government wants to see. Yeah. And thanks to RDDC, yeah. it's going to be delivered. Yeah. Also, three and a half thousand jobs since 87. That's right. Here. So, and a lot more on the way with the new shopping centre opening. Surrey Keys, new business centre. We've got, we got the bids in for that now. Yeah, uh, so we're talking about a major new town centre for Southwark. Yeah. Combination of shopping, retail, jobs, large recreation facility, big employment opportunities. A lot of work with Southwark Council coming up now, working on together on the employment and community side of this. It's really very hopeful prospects for Surrey Keys. It's yeah, terrific. Yeah. For the residents here, get a free call into the company to be able to play several. In collaboration with ASDA, British Telecom, the London Borough of Tower Hamlets and the Manpower Services Commission, we embarked recently on a pilot scheme run by the London Borough of Tower Hamlets Social Services Department to enable elderly and disabled clients from day centres to shop from home using computer terminals linked to the ASDA store. Quite a few changes around here. Oh, yeah. oh absolutely. absolutely. It's unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Do you think it's better now or worse? Or, no. or For the younger generation coming up, it's going to be. Yeah. For it makes you can't stop progress, can you? That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So you think, so you think it's a good thing yeah. what's happening? Yeah. Oh, yes. oh, oh it's going to make yeah. it. Absolutely. Put the answer in there. Personal stuff. That's the truth. That is our best shop, isn't it? We've never known shops like it in all our lives. How do, you, how do you find out the telephone? Very good. I think it's absolutely fantastic. It's the best thing that could happen to us. Absolutely. So really? you find a big benefit? I find oh, yeah. it a great benefit. And I've only used it, I mean, very new for us, isn't it? That's right. right? Very new. But I'm thrilled with it. I, I am a bit of an invalid, you know, so I'm only able to use one hand, and that stops me from carrying shopping, doesn't it? So it's brought right to my dog's Folkestone yeah, Garden, do you remember that one? Yes, I do, my yes. word, yes. Yeah. Remember that? You all got through all right, Yes, we you? got through, yes. Oh, We've still got the tap on the same corner. We've been there since 1904. Have you the been? The family, yeah. What's it called? Charlie's Cap. 
That sounds good, cosy now, isn't it? Before she gets here, I'd like to take this opportunity of making a surprise announcement. wonderful day, Your Majesty, for Southwark, for London Docking Development Corporation, for Barrett's, and for all of the other developers and people who are involved in the recreation of this area of London's <coughs> East End. You will remember this area better than most in the derelict state that it was in and the devastation that Hitler left it in. Today, I hope that you have seen something that you have found as exciting as we all find and that you will now do us the honour of saying perhaps a few words and then <coughs> cutting this tape to inaugurate uh, the Amos Estate. Your Majesty. Right. <coughs> well, I am so delighted to, this afternoon, be able to come once again to this part of London, which I have visited so often over the years and I've been very glad to be able to see something of what has been accomplished in this borough by the London Docklands Development Corporation which is seeking I know in partnership with others to bring new life and prosperity to the area. I would like to congratulate most warmly the architects, builders, and the housing associations on all that has been achieved. And I, I do hope, from my heart, that those who come to live here will find happiness and fulfillment in these attractive surroundings. Now, it gives me great pleasure to cut the tape which unveils the plaque to mark my visit today. We look forward in Docklands Corporation to making the most of this, to working with our partners to work for the future of Docklands. So this is Docklands 1988, the Isle of Dogs, the biggest building site in the whole world. More cranes here than on any other site that you can find, and yet this is just the beginning. The best is yet to come. The Royals, the great challenge east of here, where we can show once again the best of British. <laughs> 